is wearing his heels. March around the town to get some thrill. We're doing a podcast today with Mark Evans, who we were at an event a few weeks ago, and I loved how you contextualized the lay of the land in rugby quickly mm. because it, it, you, because you had to because yeah. we had an hour and also the humor in which you did it with and then delving a bit deeper and actually bringing your name up to a few people i said i'm doing a podcast i've got uh, ben gulliver i'm speaking to kelly brown i've got mark evans mark evans people that have never met you do you want to hear some of the things that yeah, they threw go on then <laughs> pioneer innovator people laughed when they said a funny guy so having someone here who has done what you've done in the game but can contextualize it and also put a different spin to be this is how it is this is your opinion and not that your opinion's right but your standing in the game and what you've done in the game gives you a platform to talk about it hmm. because from my opinion looking at rugby and I flip flop because that's the kind of guy I am I'm still young you know wow. and I'm learning around one how to contextualize talking about it mm -hmm understanding the upper echelons of commercialization money if it was me i'd be like pay the lads as much as they want to get paid don't do what they did to saracens let the sugar daddies come in sorry nigel let the the money men come in and play less games which i know you agree with mm. player welfare being at the forefront and jobs are good and but as we know the, the commercialization which we can probably start about now is shot to pieces. And I know that you, you know, you've done a few interviews on this and I'll ask you this question. Mm. What is the lay of land of rugby at the minute commercially? Because why would you like the new Saracens consortium have for 36 million or 32 million at the club? Why would anyone invest in rugby now? Well, I wouldn't. Agree. If I'm honest. Um, uh, but, and yet you, you can't avoid the fact that, there are a number of people and organizations, CBC being the most, being the most um, high profile, but Silver Lake in, in New Zealand um, and other others who have been looking around, I may well be wrong. Okay. I mean, I, I, I may well be wrong. And I suppose my, my position is a para, as a paradoxical one. Do I think rugby could be far larger than it? currently is god yes and, and i say that because i've said that for 40 years and i it drives me nuts and i don't oh well i do understand but it, i find it very frustrating why rugby union and to, to a degree rugby league which is a sport i've worked in and love as well are relative minnows when you look at the whole sporting landscape and somebody once said I, I would credit them if, if I could knew who it was, but I don't. Rugby union is a game for small countries and minorities. And there, there, there is something in that. You look around and see, well, where are the countries where rugby union has a significant role in the sporting sort of pantheon of, of each country? It's a pretty small list. And the countries where it's dominant, New Zealand, 5 million people. Wales, well, you you could have a very interesting long debate about whether it's still dominant in Wales, but it's still significant, culturally very important. Three million people. Um, Ireland. Georgia. Ireland, where it is not the dominant sport. It's made huge strides, but, I mean, it is still, if you look at all the data, you know, football is still the most popular sport in really? Ireland. Yeah, even though, even though, uh, if you go to Belfast or Dublin every weekend, there are, boatloads and boatloads of people going to Manchester, Liverpool and Glasgow to watch football. I know Northern Ireland. I lived in Northern Ireland for a couple of years, so I know yeah, that they're same very to Dublin. Football, they, okay. they, they, Northern Ireland tend to go to Glasgow and and the Republic tends to go to Manchester, Liverpool. It's just, ge just geographical well, it's, to it, a degree. It, it's Protestant and Catholic. There, uh, there is an element to that that undoubtedly ranges in Celtic mm. uh, and, and the North West clubs historically were much less strongly um, sort of sectarian. When I lived in Northern Ireland, I stopped at a petrol station as a young lad and someone said to me, um, Rangers or Celtic, Man United or Liverpool, I just said Coffee yeah. City. Yeah, quite right. Yeah, <laughs> Tottenham. Um, so Ireland's done really well, but it's not the dominant sport. But again, a small country, sixth largest country in Europe without a professional soccer league, which is one of the reasons why rugby has done so well. It was an empty market. There was no professional sport in Dublin, particularly between September and February. And, and Leinster filled that 
gap and, and but there are hardly any gaps left anywhere around the world now in well certainly in the developed world um so you look at the biggest rugby market in the world it's it's france it's about hmm, yeah look you've got to be careful with some statistics but between 20 and 25 million people in france would say uh, are living in an area draw a line from la rochelle down to lyon um, but where rugby is the dominant sport, apart from Marseille, which is not a rugby town, it's the dominant sport. Now Bordeaux is back because we lost Bordeaux for a while and we got Montpellier, which we never used to have. I say we, I mean the sport. That is the largest market in, um, in, in the world for rugby union. And it's still not the biggest sport in France. It's not as big as football. So it's the reason why, of course, um, couple of things flow from that it's the reason why on the whole the french league will always pay higher it's a it's a it's a fool's errand to chase the french league um until you can grow your own market their market they 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 can pay their players more at the moment because their broadcast revenues are higher it's as simple it's as simple as that now the answer to that is a not many english players go to uh, not many elite players leave the English league to go to France. There are one or two exceptions. It doesn't happen very often. And the other thing is the way to respond to that, to say, well, we need to grow the sport in this country. We need to, and I say, I I mean, England, you need to grow the sport in England. We need to, 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 we need to increase the broadcast figures. We need to increase the digital footprint. We need to improve the attendances. Some of the attendances at certain clubs have not grown for the best part of a decade. I mean, that, that, you know, that, so, it's not just to say, well, we'll find another rich fella and get him to pump a few million in, um, and uh, and we'll 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 afford to we'll finance the wages that way. Um, it's why that's one bit of it. The other bit of it is why Japan's so important. Because Japan's got 120 million people. Now, rugby is by no means the dominant sport. The two dominant sports are baseball and um, football. But football never used to be. The J-League, remember Gary Lineker, Grandpa I, I know the J-League. Uh, I know, I know a coach Wenger. called yeah, Tom it, Bayer. It, yes, there. it used to be. It, it never was. I mean, they did a really... So I, I've got... It, I spent quite a bit of Japan, time in Japan around the rugby circles when I was over in Perth um, a couple of years back uh, working for GRR and Western Force. That That is my big hope. It's going to take a little while, but they're, 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 there's a big country where union might, might, it's not done yet, might actually get a huge presence. That would be a, a, a real step forward. Everyone talks about the United States. I mean, I'm, people have been talking about the United States for 30 years. I still think we are a long, long way, a long way. And why is that then? Because that's a really interesting model. I mean, at Rugby Pass mm. as well, a company that I'm involved mm. in, we do a lot with the MLR. Yes. We know there's been a lot of changes. There seems to be not from a salary perspective, more from an ownership perspective and an appetite, mm. a shitload of money. Yeah, oh, there is. There is. But... We're all right, then. No, we're not. <laughs> and that's right. That, because I, I, I'll take an example from, you know, I'll take an example from the same country but a different sport to illustrate why I still think it's going to be a long road. I'm old enough, I'm afraid, to remember um, the New York Cosmos in the 1970s football yeah and the league that was set up in the united states that attracted at the time the two highest profile players in the world pele and franz beckenbauer both played for the they were all over everything they were the it was an incredibly sexy story it, they were all over it uh the league the league collapsed it didn't work okay and it took a world cup in 1990 which at, we look back now and say, well, of course it worked. Well, I can remember as that was coming out, people were not absolutely sure it would work. Although they had a huge advantage that rugby doesn't have, such a multiracial country, and many of the people who live in that country, their, um, their background and their heritage so, is in countries where football is South the America. national sport. Mm-hmm. We don't have that. OK, however, I'll now use the same country to illustrate my one of my other arguments is, however, 
what they do have going for them, or why I th- don't think we should ever give up on the United States, is that, A, they don't mind leagues failing. They almost see it as a, well, that's just the way it is, that you have to you have to keep trying, and, and, and you're not necessarily going to get it right first time. And I would make a comparison between a sport in America, a new sport, a relatively new sport in America, and rugby union that does not reflect well on us. But in 1995-96, two new leagues emerged. One was called Major League Soccer in the States, and the other was called Premiership Rugby, which I accept had been around since 87, but went pro 96-97. I was at Saracens at the time. I was head coach. Um, Two leagues could not be set up more differently in in lots of ways. Um, MLS was closed, so there's no promotion and relegation. Um, And the Premier Rugby wasn't. Um, Major League Soccer had a, had a collective bargaining agreement from the get-go with the players. We still don't. Um, there was um, there, it was a franchise model with a lot of independent governance with the commissioner, which we don't have. We try this model that will never ever work, where the clubs govern themselves, and it, 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 the, the conflicts are ludicrous, and it won't work. Well, it might work, but it's going to take an awful lot more money in the process and time. And time. So where are we? 25 years on. We're not a young league anymore in this country, the Premiership. 25 years on, there are 32 clubs in the MLS. They've been around exactly the same amount of time as we have. We're still at 12. All right, 13. And then a ludicrous thing. If we decide to put a fourth club within 10 miles of the same road, the North Circuit is going to get very, very, very crowded. Which club? If Ealing come up, you've got Saracens, Ealing, London Irish, Harlequins, and you can throw, tw- I think it's 12 miles between one another. So we're going to be quite happy, apparently. I think it's madness to put four out of our 14 clubs within 10 miles of each other. I think it's absolutely bonkers. Nothing against Ealing. Don't know the guy. Don't know. It just doesn't make any sense from a from a growth point of view. You're you not going to Leeds, don't you? Grow. I'm, no, I actually, I'm not sure who I want. The Leeds has been shown... Or Yorkshire we gave up on Yorkshire, in my view. People going about, oh, the opportunity. Uh, we're getting onto a real a, a rift. I, I'm trying to di- dial down because promotion and relegation is one of a number of issues that need to come in together. And, it, and we're not very bad at this in rugby. We tend to fixate on one thing. And um, and yet, and then even then, though, it, it's a, a closed league. I believe in a closed league with expansion. That's what I believe in. I think that I look around the world and nearly all the most successful codes and the most successful leagues, with the exception of football, and we'll come back to why football is the exception, but all the other sports, basketball, AFL, N- 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 NFL, Rugby League, the NRL in Australia, they are all have got closed leagues, that ex- the MLS that I've already mentioned, that expand over time and they grow their size, right? Nobody wants to keep... I'm the last person. This is the paradox. I'm the last person who wants to keep... We can hope, say, well, we can only have club 12 clubs playing professional rugby union at a high level because that's all we've ever had. I think that's nonsense. However, at one and the same time, I don't want to expand for the sake of it when we're already losing £50 million a year when we've got 12 clubs. We've got to grow the market. We've got to grow the audience. If you can grow the market and grow the audience, you can grow the number of clubs that way round, not, oh, well, let's give it a go here. Let's give it a go there. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So when you mean close the leagues off, you mean no relegation effectively, no promotion. I do. And some of the stuff that I've read that you've said around this Mm. is – you give it what ten years, eight years uh, in, the, in that model. I've never been. I've never been. Um, I've never been. I've never put a time frame on it because I. I. My view is this: is that the most successful leagues align all the stakeholders. So they align the owners to the players, to the clubs. So the size of the league should, in my view, be determined largely by the size of the revenues that are generated. And the players should have a fixed percentage of those revenues that are generated, because it, because at the because that way everybody has got a vested interest in growing the sport and growing the league. 
And at some point, it's interesting, the NRL are just about to do it. They're just going to a 17th team. They've got an underprovided marketplace in Brisbane. Brisbane Broncos, who are the biggest team, um, have had a massive advantage for decades. They're the only team in a 2 million strong market where rugby league's the number one sport. I know we're flip-flopping. Yeah. But in the NRL, NRL yeah. which, again, watching it, it looks phenomenal. Great, great, great competition. Is that commercially viable? Oh, God, yeah. It is? Yeah. You see all the top I was, an owner. I, was an owner. I was an owner in the in the league, uh, and uh, part. I, 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 I'd stress uh, I didn't own a big percentage of the club, but I earned a I owned a, a reasonable percentage, mm. which we've since exited, and we all made money. So that's the model that you can kind of base it on. Is you've seen it in rugby? I know, albeit rugby league. league. I've seen it. In, I've seen it in rug. Uh, look, it's not. I don't base it just on that one league. That would be silly. Um, but yes, I I uh, I have. My personal experience, and I hate that phrase, lived experience, right? But but it's true. It's true. Um, I've been, I've worked in and owned in a league where, if you run your club quite well, you will make money. You won't make it a lot of money. You'll plough it all back, and you'll get. But and you think, well, why would people do that? Why would people take over a sports club? Well, some of them are owned by members, of course, and that's, that's slightly different. But if some of them are privately owned, well, why would you do that? Why would you take a club over, make get it to profitability, which most of them are, not all of them, but quite a lot of them, um, put the money back into the club? What, what, why, why would you do that? You haven't made any money. Because, the, because for an owner, the, 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 the value is in the, in, the, is in the asset value. It's can I buy this club for 50 million and sell it for 100 but now, when people say to me, oh, I look at rugby union in this country, well, it's up to the owners, they're all rich guys, and, and, you know, it's their risk. I totally agree with that. But when people then say, oh, they're just greedy, or that, I, I see this, you see this online all the time, it makes me, well, laugh and angry, depending on how I'm feeling at a particular point in time. I can't see anybody so far in 25 years who's bought a club for X and sold it for Y whereby Y is a larger number. It, I, I can't see one. La- and then we've had a number of people come into our sport, and we've been incredibly fortunate. People like Andrew Bransaw, people like Brian Kennedy, people like um, David Thompson. They haven't made any. They've lost. Not only have they funded it through several years, they've lost money when they sold it, and they've often had to almost give it away paid and get less than what they paid for it in the first place. Now, I don't think in the long run, unless you believe there's an inexhaustible supply of people who are willing to do that, and I might be wrong, there may be. I just don't think there there are, so I don't think that model has got any kind of longevity. My other problem with it is this. If hardly any club makes a profit, it's very, very hard to get clubs to invest in growth. So, you know, to, 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 I keep coming back to this growth thing, and I know I'm slightly obsessed with it. So, so I sort of, no, I don't apologize. I just know it gets a bit boring. Um, but if you're going to grow, you have to invest. And I mean invest, in, I don't mean invest in players' salaries. I mean invest in, because Alan Sugar was right. It is the prune juice effect. He, he was absolutely right. Um, but at least in football, people can actually put some money in and then make, make some money on the asset value. There are lots of examples. Doug Ellis at Villa, the Edwards family at, at, at Man United. There, there are lots of examples of people who've gone in, bought a club, bankrolled it for a number of years and then sold out and, and made their money on the asset value. Why is that? Well, because the sport has got bigger whilst they've been owning the club. My argument is we haven't, we've had 25 years and have we grown? Yeah, we have. The revenues are up four times higher than they were at the turn of the century. So forget the two or three years to start with, where we were just starting. But you get to about 2000 and compare the revenues then to where they are now and that pre COVID. So take 2019. And this is all in the public domain. I'm not sort of breaking any confidences. It is all in public accounts. You can just go and go and look it up if you're that sad like me um we've we've grown about we've grown about four times quadrupled our revenues that's not bad it's not stratospheric but over 20 years that's not a bad effort i mean i think that compounds at 
a fairly decent um, a decent return. The growth was at the start, though, wasn't it? Well, no, 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 no. It's it's pretty, it's quite, it's pretty steady. Okay, you you, you can plot it, and I'm again sad enough to have done so. You can plot it on a graph, and it's it's fairly, it's fair. There are you 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 tend to get a a a a, a spike when there's a new television deal. Of course, you do. But you then then put the trend line in. It's it's pretty steady. But at, during that time, and this is why I go to people who say, I say to people who I often hear saying, oh, we just got to grow the revenues, grow the revenues. I say, oh, we, we've grown the revenues. We, 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 we're, 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 we're bringing in four times as much as we brought in a generation ago. But in the mid 2000s, and I know I was running Quinns at the time, but the whole league was losing about two million pounds collectively, all 12 clubs. You can, again, you can go and look it up. Um, and I and, and before anyone says who's got, you know, I am simplifying profit. Of course, I am. And I've yeah, taken please out, do. Please I've do. taken out extraneous costs, and I've taken out all that kind of stuff that are you know, one-off items. So I've tried to make it as fair as and, and reasonable as I can. Um, so, but on, but as a league, twelve, we were losing about two million pound in 2019. Revenues have gone up 3.5 times because a bit had gone up before 2000 to 2004. So let's say it's gone up three times since 2004, but the losses have gone from 2 million to 50 million. So when people say we just need to keep growing revenues, I say just growing revenues on its own has not done it. In fact, the gap between revenues and costs has got bigger. What makes you think that if we don't make some changes to things on the cost and governance side, that pattern won't go on for another 25 years. And then all you're doing is you're looking for people who tend to be men, of course, on the whole, um, well, up to this point entirely, uh, with deeper and deeper pockets. And maybe there are enough of them about. Maybe. Um, I would just like to see the sport put on a, firmer footing because the point i didn't finish earlier and i have a tendency to do this is that if you're making a loss it's very hard to get clubs to invest because they're just about keeping the lights on you know to get to make payroll every month and you're still losing money trying to persuade then somebody to invest in a long-term marketing um campaign or into their digital presence or all the other things you have to do is infinitely more difficult than if each club is making a small, reasonable return that it can then reinvest into growth. You've got, we, in my view, have got to get into that virtuous circle whereby players get a fair share and they are invested in growing those revenues so that their wages go up. But they also accept that if if those revenues go down, they get a share of a, they get the same percentage of a smaller amount. And, and I've even got a sort of, you look around the world, and I was involved in a, preparing for a, a CBA collective bond agreement back in the NRL in the mid, in the mid, uh, around about 216, around about then. And I think there were 85 items to be negotiated. It took a year. And I wasn't there for the whole process. I, I helped to start it and try and frame what we we're going to negotiate and all of it. But it, and there were 85 issues. And, in America, you know, the NBA CBA is something like 500 pages long. They take forever, but they last for five, seven, ten years. Um, that's why baseball's going to have a strike this year because theirs has run out and they haven't really negotiated a new one. So there's going to be a lockout. The owners are going to lock the players out. Um, so, but it comes down to two big things, and they're linked. What percentage of what they call player-generated revenues? So I won't bore you, the people listening, with what that means. But basically, the money that's made by the game, not all of it, because some of the things like if you own a hotel like Wasps, that shouldn't go in. That's got nothing to do with the game. But, you know, ticket revenue, broadcast, merchandise, all that. That goes in. Right, what is it? Whatever million it is. The players should get a percentage of that, and that effectively becomes a salary cap. And we were saying when we were, well, what do we want? Well, we want, we think 27%. We think 27% is about right. That leaves enough for 
grassroots because it was the governing body as well. Leaves enough for grassroots investment, and yet the players are getting a fair return. And the players' union came in and said, "We want twenty nine percent." And guess what? We finished at twenty eight. <laughs> And at the same time, you have the second big thing is, all right, what's the grant to the clubs? Because the clubs then say, great, you've negotiated what we're going to have to pay out to the players as a percentage of what's being earned by the game. So the middle and all the clubs. Fine. Well, what are we, what's, our, what's our distribution? What's our central distribution, we call it? They just call it the grant. What's the grant? And the argument then is, well, is it 120% of the player's share or is it 125 or is it 130 or is it and so you have all these different stakeholders negotiating for how you carve it up and then they put it in a box for five years or 10 years depending on when the next revenue when the next broadcast deal is and so what you have then is if you now run your club well and the salary cap's incredibly hard to break. I've got to tell you how hard that is to break. <laughs> it's, it's, we could go, why is it so different to the one we've got? Well, it's, trust me, it's very different. Very, very different. But that as well. So there's no one thing. I keep saying to people, there's no one magic bullet, silver bullet, that's going to fix this. Promotion and relegation on its own, getting rid of it, will not fix this. But you need it. Reforming the salary cap so it's much, much more difficult to evade will not fix this, but you need it. A collective bargaining agreement with the Players Association will not on its own fix it, but you need it. And all those things are interlinked. So you have to come up, and I'm not naive to think you can do all of those things overnight. OK, and that you're going to have to get one of them and then another one and then another one. Governance is the other big one. Is, is that how do you ever expect? Because I've sat around that. I sat around Premiership Rugby Board table for nigh on 15 years. Anything got done? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, a couple of things did get done. Uh, well, we brought salary cap in. Yeah. Uh, and that was a time, the first time round when people were just bleeding so much cash. And that was good. And then we did... Probably, I would say, the most successful thing of all was that at the time, and we were talking about this um, before we came on air, as it were, we, we were spending, and all the clubs were spending a lot of time and money and effort trying to find the best kids from anywhere in the country. So, you know, you'd go up to Newcastle and see if there's a kid there and down to Devon, see if there's a kid there, and then the other clubs obviously would know about them, and then you get into a bidding war, and it was ridiculous. Just, so we, instead of that, we said, right, why don't we divide the country up into areas that are roughly got the same number of registered juniors. In other words, 11 to 12 to 18 year olds. So every club's got roughly the same number to, in their area. The map will look a bit funny because it doesn't fit to where the clubs are, but you can, you can work around that. Two big gaps, Yorkshire and the, and the time, the far southwest. He said, well, let the RFU run those. That, that took a bit of persuading of some of the clubs. Well, let the RFU run something. Because, you know, we were at daggers drawn. So, you know, let, the, let, let, let them run. We, we haven't got a club there. We can't manufacture a club. Let the RFU run those. And those players are anybody can go for at 18. But then in your patch, you now concentrate what you should be concentrating on, which is if you believe talent is randomly distributed over time, which I think most people do, if we've all got roughly the same number of players to have a go at, it then comes down to how good are our pathways? How good are our coaches? How good are our development um, propositions? Which is what we should be competing over. Not, well, if you offer that kid 15 grand, I'll offer him 20. You know, that's a stupid way to run a sport. But isn't uh, that what all sports do? No, of course they don't. So, well, 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 I haven't gone to the most extreme and I don't think this would work. I, you know, lots of sports have a draft. Don't they? You know, lots of sports have a draft for eighty, just for eighteen-year-olds. Not, not for the well. In 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 some of the American sports, it's for college, and it, with basketball, it's nineteen, not eighteen. And and you know, and 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 in the AFL, it's just for eighteen-year-olds. And the NRL don't have it at all. And I don't think actually, although in principle, I think it's a really good idea. I don't think it's it's one of the, it'd be a, it'd be a long way down my list. A Is the NRL central central contracted though? No. 
It's not so no. that so the individual clubs God, can offer player that movements. Player they're X. massive. Player because, movement there is massive because they'll be getting paid more money to go. Uh, no, they play. Sometimes people go to win a trophy. True. Um, sometimes they go because they really like the coach. In Australia, quite a lot of them go back to where they're from. So a lot of Queenslanders, uh, having gone to Sydney or come to Melbourne or even gone to Auckland for a for, a, for an opportunity, will often when they get to their sort of mid twenties, mid thirty, uh, mid twenty, mid thirties, when they get to their mid twenties, will will drift back to Queensland and try and get a contract with the Bronx or the or the Titans or one of those or, or the Cowboys. Great names, you know. Um, yeah, well, there's another thing. You know, we're we're a mishmash, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, of course. Come on, make your mind up, guys. Either call them by the bloody towns and get rid of the bears and get rid of the tigers, or make everybody you know, be consistent. It's a simple marketing rule you know it confuses the it confuses the public it does we could be here for hours talking about how confusing oh. the, the game is one of the things i want to before we even touch the schedule <laughs> I, I mean you know before we even get into the podcast <laughs> i want to just pick something up you said there because i know that you're big on player salaries and yeah. so am i yeah. and we are probably quite different i don't mm. know whether that's because we were joking about it i was grossly underpaid or overpaid how you look at it <laughs> But I understand what it takes to be a player at the highest level and also the demands of playing 30, and if I was fit, yeah. more games during the season and yeah. across many tournaments, which involves travel. So from the Premiership, sorry, from pre-season to the Prem games or the URC games or top 14 games when I played over there, to internationals, uh, to the Prem Cups, which is now in there, Challenge Cup, European games, knockout games, it's a lot. So... It was inter- it's interesting listening to your take on how much players should get paid. Mm. I don't know what the average salary is. When I was playing, it was around 60 to 80 grand. There were players that were in and around the team that started to earn 300, 350, yeah. to the point where my last year at Saracens, not just at Saracens, mm-hmm. no, no. other teams we were hearing 500 grand, yeah. 700 yeah. grand, yeah. Charles Piertel, a yeah. million pound. Except pretty much, but outliers, to be fair. Marquis. Yeah, as they called right. them, marquees. Call them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Call them uh, what you like. Players where you'd look at and you were like, how the fuck has that happened? Compared to, I had my mate in here talking about what the championship get yeah. paid. So, one of the points I'll pick up on is you mentioned about players percent, potentially getting a percentage mm. of the club's revenue. No, no, not of the club, of the game. Of the revenue. game, sorry. That's of fine. Yeah, not, was, no, you can't have that. Why would you go to Worcester because, or yeah, yeah, you can't ahead have of that. the Tigers or, no, a, a, no, you or wouldn't, Gloucester? No, you can't yeah. because... And if you get on to, it, it gets quite, and I suppose this is one of the reasons maybe, because it, it, it does get quite complicated and, and you have to have all these things. In port. So just to respond to a couple of those points, very good points you made. And I'm, you know, it's a tough, tough sport. Don't, you know, I, I fully accept that. And it's very demanding physically. But so are lots of other sports. Look at people who do Olympic sport. Absolutely. They get paid. Virtually nothing. And I'm maybe still enough of a romantic about sport to say there are other things that are important as well as, not instead of, but as well as uh, the remuneration. I, I bend to nobody in my distaste and opposition to some of the things that happen in our sport in this country in terms of low wages. I, I'm in favour of minimum wage. Matt said, one of the things that you see, and this is why you need, again, comes back, why do you need a CBA? Well, one of the reasons you need a CBA is you need a minimum wage. Okay? that, that A player, full-time job, but we haven't even got in the premiership, let, let alone the, I'll come on to the championship in a little minute, right? But let's just talk about the premiership for a moment. There should be a minimum wage in the, in the what premiership. What number? It's with a number. Well, Again, it comes back to, let's say the players get 30% of, it's all linked. Let's say players get 30% of 200 million, right? I'm making these up, but they're not far off, okay? So that's 60 million to be divided amongst, well, 12 or 13 or 14 or whatever it is. But actually, if you go to 14, the salary cap comes down, right? Because you've got the same amount of money, hasn't suddenly gone up a little bit with some crowds, but the broadcast thing hasn't changed, which puts then your salary cap in at what? Let's make the numbers really easy. Let's say the salary cap comes in at five, 12 fives are 60, right? Okay. 
and no fiddling around with marquee players and no fiddling around with, you know, play your players two weeks into in the next two weeks window. And then you can take the 75 percent reduction, which is theoretical. So you actually you're still playing at a 6.4 million salary cap when everyone else is playing at five. God, that is such an English fudge. Of course. Nonsense. I would then say, right, let's say it's five million. I'd have a, I'd have a salary collar as well. So you can't play less than let's say 90% of 5 million. So that even the club, and I'm not going to say who it might be, let's say there's a, one of the smaller market clubs. So, well, actually, cool, 5 million, you know. Can we, mm, but, all right, you can pay up to 4.5, but you can't go less than 4.5. That's it. You know, we, because otherwise you get what's called a free rider. If you've got no promotion and relegation, you have to make sure you don't get a free rider whereby they go, oh, well, well I'm, I'm, not, I'm under no risk. I'll pay 2 million. You, know, you can't have that because the reason you're doing it is to make the league really, really competitive or competitive balance so that every year you genuinely think every team might win it. And you can't have that without a collar because at the end of the day, the teams that win tend to be paying at or who knows, occasionally over the, the cap. So you have to have a collar on it. And the other thing that would make a huge difference and again, they're all linked. I would bring in a maximum nut squad size. I, and I'd probably make it around. And we had that in the NRL. Our maximum, our, we could only have 30. Well, it was 25 in my time. It's now 30. You're only allowed to have 30 players in your salary cap. And how many games do the NRL play? 22 regular season. 22 in 24 weeks. There's no breaks. Bang, 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 bang. And then four rounds of play, and then four rounds of what they call finals. So, And if you play State of Origin and you play for Australia, you might play 30 games. Okay. But not many of them. So if you don't make finals, you, make, you play 22, and that's, you, that's your, 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 you're done. 30 sounds about right. So they were allowed, we, we were allowed in my time, 25 players... And I think the salary cap at the time was about five and a half million dollars. It's now eleven million dollars cap. Why? Because the revenues have gone up. Okay, the cap's gone up, nearly doubled because the revenues have nearly doubled. Because it's a really good product, and the television companies will pay more for it. And it's on free to air, and it's it's written about in all the not just the broadsheet papers. It's written about in the mid market papers as well. So I just don't believe that rugby can't grow into those markets because. I've seen it. So you had you're 30 players or 25 players, and it was up to you how much you gave to each player, but you couldn't go below the minimum wage. Which was what? At the time, it was, it's a, it's a lot higher. I think it was 80. It's now 120. And what's that in the UK? Oh, well, halve it. Okay. All right, halve it. So you can't get paid less than 40,000, and you can't, oh, well, now you can't get paid less than 60,000. Unless you were in what they called the, if you like, we call it the academy or the second tier. You could have as many as you like in that lot, but you could only pay a certain number of them in the first team in a, in a particular season. So you've got, this is how much the game's generating. This is how much the players are getting. This is the number of players in each squad. Right, clubs, you now, now it comes down to what clubs should be competing about which is a skill, which is right. Where, how do we put our cap? I mean, at the Storm, for a few years, we had 40% of our cap in three players. 40% of our cap in three players. The other 22 got 60% and the top three got 40%. And here's another kicker. And in one season I was there, the number one on the roster on terms of uh, salary, a uh, guy called Billy Slater, wonderful Oh, I know. I've, I've watched State of Orange in many times. Fantastic player, Billy. Got injured in week one. Mm. And there lies the issue. No. No, that's not the issue. No? No. Losing don't your forget, biggest star player. Don't forget. Don't forget. There's no, there's no relegation. Okay? So my reaction coming from England, whereby, oh, injury clause, injury clause. And I went to see my salary cap manager. Shows how seriously they took it. They had a salary cap manager in the club. That's all he did. And, and trust me, he worked bloody hard. It was so important. I said, well, what happens now? He said, well, we play, we play without him. He said, we're now playing with the salary cap of $4 million. I said, well, how does that work? He said, well, look, Mark, and I, I'll never forget this. He said, look, luck in sport. We're, we're in a league that tries to even everything out. He said, we never succeed. There are always stronger clubs and weaker clubs. But we try really, really hard to even it out so that the teams are pretty similar in terms of ability. Why? 
because we're trying to grow the league, not the individual club. He said a disaster for us is if it's like we used to have when the Brisbane Broncos used to win every year because they were the richest club. He said it killed it. Just the game didn't move. It just didn't grow. It was dull. It was Scottish football. With all due respect to my Glaswegian <laughs> relations, it was Scottish football. And if you think that's a good league I don't. and that's what we want to watch, well, I, I'm sorry, we, and I know you don't, but if people who do, and my cousins, for instance, I said, don't you get bored? Well, if you're a Rangers fan, they beat Dundee three 0 at the weekend. They're 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 Celtic. They're all Celtic fans because we're Irish Catholics. Back going back, and they go, "No, we just won nine titles in a trot. We love it." I find that incomprehensible, and I do say, "Well, that's great, guys." But have you ever looked at the size of your league compared to the one next door to you, or the one in France, or the one in Germany? I mean, I know you're a small country, but you know, everybody when it nobody is it nobody's won it apart from Rangers and Celtic since 1980. I mean. That's no. Well, that's it shows not, you. I know we competition, is it? I, I know we're going off on a tangent, but that's why Gerard went to Villa and he literally just left like that as yeah, soon as the opportunity just like came. That. Because as did what more? Yeah, what more you know, can you do? Because, but so he said, that's what we're trying to avoid. So well, you're a really strong club, and we were Melbourne. Have been, we're a very strong club, still are a very very strong club. He said, so you just have to play with Anne for a year till he gets fit again. Now, what that did, without putting an extra dollar on the cap or having to spend any more money, we just had to go, right, well, all right, how are we going to fix it? And actually, what it led to is a kid came through called Cameron Munster, who was 19 years old, who is now playing uh, halfback for um, uh, for Queensland and the Kangaroos, who started at fullback because Billy got injured. And because he had to. And, because and, they had, and we had to. We had no choice. We had no. We were up to the cap. Billy's million stayed in the cap, even though we couldn't play because we had to lodge it at the beginning of the year. And everyone goes, look, it's luck, Mark. It's like, you know, you ended up in a rainstorm and couldn't win. Luck is an important part of sport. And your best player, you chose to pay him a million. You could have spread your cap out more evenly and then it wouldn't hit you so hard. You knew the risks. Suck it up. So so, so, that's, a, so that's a simpler <laughs> process there because not there's no grey areas in the salary cap, but there seems to be a huge opportunity to manipulate the salary cap in the UK in terms of credits yes. with yes. the academies. Yeah. Yeah. And academies, credits, marquees. Marquee, of course, and all these and different that components. And ridiculous fiddle I've already referred to, which will, you know, means that actually three or four clubs never went to five million, uh, uh, you know, when I, I, I post-COVID because there was that, because, and this has happened a lot and then we come back to governance now. Um, it's always going to be more, much more difficult in this, in, in English rugby because the league is controlled by effectively by the clubs and there's a there's a conflict of course there's a conflict that you wouldn't most well governed sports don't have that because you would have to be a saint not to vote for and against certain things that were either in in or against the interests of the club you love so that is another part of, you know, I said there's lots of different things that need to come together. That The other bit is, is, is governance. I mean, I'll, I'll just give you another example. And uh, this is true of lots of leagues, but I, I, and I, but having worked it, I, I remember going, to, when, I, when I went to Melbourne, and used to, went up to Sydney to talk about the cap, to talk about what I, what, and it, it's a huge document. It took a lot of learning. It really did. And then I went up to Sydney to the headquarters of the league, and there's four people working on the cap Full time, full time. That's their job. And, and, I, and the Prem have got an external company. Oh no, 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 no! They're employed by the league. They're employed by the league, and they sometimes bring in um, independent investigators. Yeah, and you have to you have to give over computer records, and you have to give over a whole lot. The, the, the regulations are far, far, far tighter. Um, and I said, I had a lovely chat, learnt a lot, and said, "Tell me, guys, I've got one question. What's your starting point?" From when you're you're in charge of the cap across the sixteen teams and ensuring equity and all the rest of it and finding you know looking for people who have found loopholes and and all this kind of stuff and acting on rumours and whistleblowers and all these kind of stuff. I said, yeah. I said, I said, what do you start from? What's your starting point? And one of them said, well, he said, if I'm being perfectly honest, our starting point is we assume you're cheating. Show us you're not. And and I thought that was brilliant. I thought that was absolutely the right attitude. Is we're assuming you're a bunch of cheating bastards. Show us that you, 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 
Show us that you're clean hands. And that means they've got full accounts of everything in terms of... And it's not perfect. Putting clubs, a lot of work into the, it. The, the clubs do, you know, since in my time, in Melbourne, before our time, you know, it got a huge fine. Um, you know, they got caught breaching the cap and they got two premierships stripped. They lost them. They, they're no longer there. They got two minor premierships stripped, million dollar fine. And this was the one that killed... That this is taught to people were there then. This is the one that really hurt. They said, you have to play because no relegation, remember. So what do they do? They have to play a whole season for no points. So if they won, won, they got zero points and the opposition got two points. Of course, how do you motivate a team? And they did. They came fourth. You know, fair play. They have got one of the generationally great coaches who's been there since 2002. And they have actually got a really strong culture and they came back. But then Parramatta got caught and that was really interesting. Can you imagine this? Parramatta Eels, who are now quite a strong club, but in my time, I were really quite weak. Hell of a name as well. Got caught breaking the cap. And that year, they come last. Now, that takes some doing, doesn't it? Mm. They came last. They came stone cold last, and yet they broke the cap. They, they got themselves into such a mess. And I thought, I tell you what, if that had happened in England, they'd have gone, oh, well. They came last. Doesn't really matter. Sweep it under the carpet. No, no, no. They got banged six points for the next season. They got a fine. People lost their jobs, etc. It's not perfect. People push it and push it and push it. But the way it's structured with minimum wages and a fixed squad and all these other lots of other things, it's quite a big document. I won't bore you with it. It's so much more effective. Whereas we, to my personal knowledge people go on about the saracens and i'm not and i was at saracens 20 years you know i'm very fond of the club in lots of ways fond of the people and but that was the fourth time not that club necessarily i know personally of four occasions when salary cap breaches over the years and i'm going right back to the beginning this cap came in in i think 98 99 i can think of i can think of the Four occasions it got swept under the carpet. Mm. All right, now, and people wonder why. And, and what usually happens, swept under the carpet, amnesty and the cap goes up. I, I find that it's very strange. Well, that's because the power of the clubs that were sweeping under the carpet. Come back to governors. Because on the salary cap stuff, and I spoke to Neil Golding. Mm. For the first one of these. I, I heard that. And he didn't give me much, obviously, uh, but he did reiterate that the cat was going to be looked after yeah. in-house yes. by him personally. Yeah. It was on him, especially yeah. with his background. But I think you're right in what you were saying. Even as a player, when you knew there was a salary cap, it was just like, ah, oh, as in it wasn't that bigger thing it wasn't that big a deal you you know when you've got your cap is working there's some absolutely key signs and there's some absolutely key signs when it's not and here's one when it is right um and i'll use another example i know people say oh you've gone about melbourne well i loved it there i loved it there as much as i loved it at harlequins it was a big influence so i'm and i was an owner until last year and i go back for all the grand finals and you know it's, it's I'm very emotionally attached to it Still own 1%. It's a oh. center, sentimental 1%. It's a big percent right? as well. Still 1%, sentimental reasons. Um, and they, as Melbourne do, they found this kid called Ryan Pappenhausen, who plays fullback. Fullback is the highest paid position in the NRL. Everyone, virtually every club's number one player is a fullback. So if you go to the Roosters, um, their number one player um, is is their fullback. You go to, it, it, it's Who just would be a most, UK fullback? Um, or was it Sinfield? Well, no, it's more about no. It actually it's where Jason Robinson used to play. Okay, it's where Jason Robinson used to play. It's the most influential position because you can play both sides of the pitch. You can play off the halfback. It's just the most you have the most impact on the game. So the salary cap reflects that. The highest paid players tend to always be fullbacks. The lowest paid players used to be wingers, and now it's centres. They get the least. It's very very structured. You don't have to do that. It's where the market has. Worked it out. You know, want to make money in rugby league? And you'll talk about players, you talk, why do they move? Some players move clubs to play fullback. What they're really saying is, I'm moving because I'll be the highest paid player. And that's just that's just the way it goes. But anyway, Quinn's discovered this kid, like they're very good at it. Their, their talent ID is fantastic. Called Ryan Pappenhausen, who just couldn't get a run at the Titans. I think it was the Titans. He, he wasn't playing, hardly playing, or the Tigers or somewhere. 
So they brought him down, put him in the second tier. He wasn't in the salary cap squad. You know, he was just training and training contract. Anyway, took him two years, pushed past three players. The kid's a star. He's up for contract renewal. His market's value about 1.2 million. And, oh, and they're much, much more public about um, – they're not like the American clubs whereby it's actually published – Everybody knows. The press know, the, and because the press know, the public know. They might be out by 50 grand, but it, it's pretty pretty good. You know, you'll, you'll have talk shows where they say, well, he, he's got an offer of 600. I don't think he's a $600,000 player. You know, it's much, much more healthier. Um, whereas in rugby union, we go, oh, dear, no, no, very British. You know, so don't get that either. So Ryan is worth about 1.2 on the market if he leaves Storm. Storm can't afford him on 1.2 in their cap. They've got too many other... <coughs> He signs for Storm for three years on 800. About 400 under his market value. And they, and he interviewed, they interview him afterwards after he signed. Why did you stay, Ronnie? And he said, well, I'm happy here. He said, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity the club's given me. And I knew that if I took my market value, I wouldn't be surrounded by as many good players. Because I'd be taking up too much of the cap. Now, when you get a player saying that publicly, you know as an outside observer, that that cap is working. Because if you're getting up, and he, everybody knew his market value. There were clubs who everybody knew would offer him 1.2 million. They tended to be at the bottom, and they needed a marquee player to get them back. And he would have done the job. He's a wonderful, wonderful player. He's about five foot seven and 75 kilos, ringing wet. It's extraordinary. He's so quick. But he wants to stay, but he wasn't prepared to stay and rip the arse out of it because he wanted to win stuff. And under that system, if you get your, they call it getting your cap bent out of shape. If your cap gets bent out of shape, in other words, too many old players, not the money in the wrong positions, money put into areas that don't influence the game very much, an imbalance of positional, so you get caught with injuries because your, your cap wasn't, your, your, your positional um, things weren't structured well in your cap, in your, in your thirty. You, hadn't, you didn't have enough outside backs. You had too many front five forwards. It comes back to bite you. You can't fix it. The only way you can fix it is cheating, and cheating's really risky because if you get caught, the penalties are enormous. That's an effective cap. Yeah, absolutely is. I know people say, oh, you talk so much, Mark, and I, I think it's a fair comment. Um, but I tried to do that as quickly as I could, and I left out quite a lot of things that are quite interesting and do have an influence, but... I'm trying to get across the idea that it's not enough just to have a salary cap. It's got to be the right type of cap and it's got to be structured well. And it's got to fit in with all those other things that we talked about, about not having payers being underpaid. I'm way, way, way more concerned about what we do to players in the championship. And I think it's a disgrace to the sport that we both love than I am worried about bringing down the overall payments in the premiership so it becomes in line with what we're generating and then we can all gen we can all concentrate on growing because i'll just finish this off we look at the last 25 years look at the different stakeholders who's done well well i'll tell you who's done well and this is not a pop at players players have done very well compared to what they were on right i do I pine for the days when I could sign Tony Dippers and Richard Hill for 40 grand a piece? No, I don't. I don't. But that's all that was, that was the market at the time. Players have done well. Coaches have done fantastically well. They really have. They really, really Over have. Over half a million on some of them. I know. And there you have another conflict. Whereas the, co the coaches just want to win. And quite right, you, you shouldn't put it on the coaches to keep the cap under control. Their job is to win. The job of the governance is to make sure it's a cap they can't avoid, and then they have to coach and develop and recruit well within a band that everyone's meeting to. So they've done well. Agents have done well. Look at the consolidation of the agents since the game went pro, and look at some of the money that's been made by the three or four that have survived. Don't get me wrong. You need agents. Of course you do. Every market needs agents. But they work for the players. They don't work for the clubs, Absolutely. and they should be paid for the club by the. And then, who's not done so well? Owners, owners have lost about half a billion. You add it all up, it's about five hundred million pounds, and no one's made an asset sale pro 
gain, right? So the owners have not done great. And the one that no one ever talks about, which I find interesting, and it's partly because the, the clubs are making losses. So what, what are the, where are the, where can you mitigate that? The fans. You look at ticket prices. You know, we're a, we're a, we're a sport that's trying to grow its audience size. And you look at the ticket prices for Premiership Rugby in some of those grounds. You can't get a ticket at Bath. And I don't blame Bath for this at all, right? I don't blame, blame Bath because they're not making money either. It's, and, they, and they're full. It's 41 quid, right? But there are lots, and, and, and I think Harlequins, my old club, is, is very far off that either, okay? We are effectively excluding a potential audience on economics because we are we're, we're charging prices at some grounds. I do hesitate, not all. And why are we doing that? Because the model is broken and we're desperately just trying to sort of bail out a, 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 a a, a boat that's hold below the waterline. God, what a strange analogy. Was. I, I get it, that. though. But, yeah. So I suppose what I'm saying is we've done okay despite ourselves, but we could do so much better. But it's a, it's a, it's a lot of things over a period of time done consistently. And trying to get that through 12 or 13 or 14 clubs, all quite understandably with their own agenda, is just incredibly difficult. With zero joined up approach. So I'm going to hit you with a question you didn't answer. Mm. So with what you know mm. and what you've experienced, again, there's no point talking about the NRR when it comes to player values. It's a different sport. Mm. What level, knowing the finances in the game mm. and where we are now, coming out of COVID, if you can say that we're coming out of COVID, that a player should be paid minimum in a squad and then... What do you think the maximum should be for yeah. a semi run run draw or a Maru Toji? I think I think the minimum is around about forty grand. And that's for if you're in the if you're in the salary cap squad. I mean, there'll be there'll be youngsters that will always you know I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about I'm talking about your squad that you have to declare. Like you have to declare for the Heineken Cup. This is our squad, this is what our salary cap applies to. These players. Let's say it's thirty eight of them, right? I think the minimum salary should be around about and I haven't done the sums on this, and it's going to, of course, now I'm going to go and do this properly, right? But this is top of my head stuff. But more from being a director of rugby yeah, and right. a coach. Yeah, and... I've been a long way. I'm a, I haven't been in the Premiership for 10 years, so I'm I'm a little out of, with the with the individual salaries, I'm a little out of touch. Because I'd say but 40 if, grand is nothing to be a professional rugby player. Well, if, you're, if you're not in the team, right, and, it, and you're 21 years old, and you're the third choice fly half, 40 grand, 40 grand for it on a two year contract is fine because actually, if you go, if you think of it like this, let's say, let's say the cap's 5 million, right? Which I think the game, I think probably I, but with no marquees and no academy and no, um, no injury clause, right? You could, pr you can actually just do the maths and say, okay, so divide it into 38 into 5 million. And, and, and what does that come to? I don't know. It's about a hundred, and I'm just doing this in my head, 117. Yeah, it's about 130, something like that. Okay. That's about your average. Mm -hmm. Now, I personally don't like a maximum salary. I think I, I want to give the club, I think that's part of the skill. I'd let the clubs decide how they allocated those 30 salaries, but the lowest one can't be lower than 40 grand. But on the maximum one, when you hear that... <laughs> When you hear that a semi round rounder is on a million, which I or, don't know whether that's true or not, or Piertel, we, well, we can't know that Piertel is on a million. That's, We've heard it's certainly been bandied about. And like you said, when you hear stuff, it's generally correct, even if it's 900 grand, mm. even if it's 800 mm. grand. Do you think a player of that quality should be getting paid that? Because I do. Right. The, okay. and, the, and the reason I do, and again, this is something that I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on, mm. is if you're a Bristol fan, and you know that Semi Ran Randra is playing, you'll probably play, pay 40 quid to go and watch him. Okay. Because you know that he's playing. So therefore, that is the football model, isn't it? In terms of how they consign players. Like Ronaldo goes back to Man United and they pay a ridiculous amount of money and you know that you're going to get that money back. One, because people are going to tune in to watch him if, if there's a subscription, which I don't know if there is, but they're going to buy his shirt or they're going to do anything that they can to buy a 200 quid ticket or whatever it is at Man United that you probably have to wait two years to get and he'll probably be gone anyway. So do you see what my point? I do. And again, let me just kind of carry on where I see things. Mm -hmm. 
Marutoji in terms of growing the game and the demographic of people that someone like that or a Marcus Smith would pull in to keep them at your club and everything that comes with that player, both from a social media, which is arguably superficial, but we also know that has value in terms of brand value, both for the player, individual and the club, then surely paying him more money for them reasons is a reason to do it in terms of growing the game's popularity for the younger generation of people that are going to want to come and watch rugby matches because the game I think has to change in terms of how it looks and how slow and how mundane it can potentially oh, be. Let's talk about that for a minute. Yeah. Well, but in, so, in a minute. Yes. So, I so, so, that, so that question in terms do, of like yeah, the value yeah, of players yeah. and individuals isn't necessarily about their value as a rugby player, but a value as their brand. I've got, I think, I understand the argument, but I think it's the wrong way round. And I'll tell you for why, because I've seen this over, it's the advantage of being old. All right. So, I remember when in 1996, 97, we bought Francois Pinard, Michael Liner, and Philippe Seller. And we assumed, and I did as well. Custom right? had as well? No, no. He was two or three years later. Oh, okay. Right? But they were the big three. We already, I'd already got Kieran Bracken and um, Paddy Johns and the Wallace brothers and whatever. We go, we, 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 we won the cup and got pit by point from another superstar team with Tuigamara and Wilkinson and Pat Lamb up in Newcastle. What cup right? was it? The Pilkington? Hmm? What cup was it? Derby was 48. Yeah, well, they, they, they still, they were still knockout cup in 98. But what was it called? The Pilkington? No, it was Tetley. Oh, Tetley. Tetley. Yeah, oh, yeah. Tetley. 48, 48, not many against Wasps. Um, great day. Anyway, and, and we assumed, and I did too, and I learned a lot from this, that bringing in what I considered at the time to be three of the most famous players in the world, and they were, and they were great, great people, um, would the crowds would just flock. Well, they didn't. The t- the reason that w- what what made people flock to Saracens and they did in the in the in that ninety eight season the the season after was a guy called Peter Deacon who understood marketing and he understood pricing and he understood promotion and I learned a whole an awful lot from him uh, you know unfortunately you know passed away you know, not that many years afterwards to be honest great loss to the game um, and I remember learning that then this is not about star power because actually you get caught in that sort of our game small. So the stars aren't that big. And another example, I look at Johnny Wilkinson at Newcastle. Probably the biggest crossover star the game's yet produced still. I don't think it's certainly in this country. Absolutely. Because he was a gorgeous man as well. Didn't, didn't really move the dial. At he Kingston didn't want Park. No, hold on. But why didn't it? Why everyone, you know, because the game in that part of the country, right, is it's not one of the stronger areas. Okay. And just bringing in, uh, just bringing in high profile names will not necessarily, I don't think, I think it's very little evidence that that moves the dial. Bristol, you could say, and, and sorry. No, I'll rephrase that. That's a, that's a bad example. Um, I would. I think it's perfectly okay if a club chooses. Let's say we'll work on the numbers we've been working on. Let's say the, the cap's five million. If someone wants to spend a million pound on one player, that's entirely up to them. We we did at Melbourne, right? Albeit on a smaller squad, right? But let's say in union with thirty thirty eight, you might say, all right, if you want to put somebody on eight hundred thousand pounds. Actually, we were in dollars, so of course it's a lot more than we were paying. Yeah, um, eight hundred thousand pounds. That's still a, a pretty decent salary. You use the term worth. Well, I'm I challenge the whole concept of worth, unless you can show me, and I don't know anyone who has ever shown me that yet, that bringing in this player at a premium of let's say four hundred, pay him eight. Really could have got someone quite similar, maybe not quite as good at four. He's paying a premium of four. Show me where the extra 400000 is coming from. Net of costs of sale, by the way, not just revenue. Net revenue, not gross. And I'll, I'll go along with it. I still think they need to be in the cap and the club has to decide. My point is this. If, if caps and limited squads right, are so damaging to player earnings... I'd say have a look at basketball because they've got all that. Have a look at American football because they've got all that. 
have a look at AFL in Australia because they've got all those things, and their yeah, player and their player salaries have gone have 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 gone up. And not just for the odd one, not just for the odd outlier. Their player salaries have gone up consistently without generating huge losses at club level because they've got the things that that, that there's this idea that you bring in these things and it will dampen down players' salaries. I just don't accept it. It might do in the short run for a few, but in the long run... It will grow the sport and grow the revenues, and the players who are on a fixed percentage of a growing revenue base will do really well. That's my argument. Well, the other issue that we have, I, again, I'm conscious we've got about 20 minutes left. Max, there's a couple of other things. It's great. Sorry. The other thing alongside that is trying to align, and we'll get onto it, the global calendar. Because oh. how do you... But, <laughs> but, but, but with the idea and the model that you're saying mm. which i think is a great model mm. it'd be near on impossible because you've got the autumn nations and you've got the six nations yeah. that lie yeah. in the middle yeah. of the season along with another competition in the european cup yeah and, and the only answer the only way around that the only way around it is each of those because the southern hemisphere have a different problem they don't have enough product right to go to australia they just don't play enough games australia definitely don't right south africa Quite difficult to, there's so much change there at the moment, quite hard to see what, how that's going to play out. And New Zealand don't play enough games unless you're the All Blacks. And they basically have a different model where the All Blacks. The All Blacks generate all the money in it. And then, but their distribution is, oh yeah, but they've got a CBA, Jim, and they've got a salary cap and they've got a tiered system and they've got a percentage of central revenues going to the players. All those so, so things. So they have it right. No, I think their central revenue percentage is a little bit too high. They're at 36. Okay. I think they should be more at 33. But I'm quibbling now. I think close for, to being for right. a small country, right, which look, needs to maximize its assets and can only get a certain number of people into the ground. I mean, it's, it's just a small country, albeit won't be mad. I think they're pretty well run. Yes. There's his brand value, though, isn't it? Global brand yeah, value, and that, which they know. You, you, which they do know. But nevertheless, they, they brought in things for the whole of their, if you're an elite end of their sport, that make an awful lot of sense. They do. It's a lot better than um, than, than our arrangements at the moment. Yeah, I do think it is. But, you know, I'm still optimistic, you know, that we might get there. Summer rugby. No. You shot me down. No, I did. I did. I did. Only because I think the market's so much more difficult. Oh, sorry, and come back to your last point, which I sorry, I just remember I didn't really answer. So properly, answer and then I'll come which and is, some rugby. Which say, is okay. fewer. The, the only way to sort the schedule out, and this is quite a big ask, but it's the only way. The rest of it will just fill up. It'll just fill up, fill up, fill up. Uh, and this is from an English perspective, which is not the whole story. Each of the three competitions, or each of the three, but Europe, Premiership, and International have got to play. I've got to take a cut play fewer games right so not that many fewer i think you only one or two weekends each. you need you need I've, I've done the work you've you need about five weekends back okay get rid of the premiership cup get rid of the premiership shield we haven't got time into what i do with that in terms of what how i you reinvigorate the championship which you need all i would say about it is every professional sport needs a functioning second tier. So it's the pathway. Uh, it? It's the pathway. It's not a commercial thing. So you have to divert resources from the international and the premiership game into the championship because without it, the international game and the, cha and the premiership will be weaker over Absolutely. time. Right? It's a question of how you do it, not whether you do it. So coming back to the premiership and the, and the, the season structure, you need about five weekends back. And if you did that... There is a way of restructuring the English stroke European season whereby you only lose your players for a couple of weeks in the autumn. And I do mean a couple and you play without them. Then you can get the premiership finished before the six nations. You then play the six nations and then play playoffs. I would make the playoffs slightly longer and create like almost a competition. And then you play Europe in a block. And if everybody gave up a bit in terms of the weekends, and that means no fourth international in the autumn, right, ever, 
ever. Well, it's not, not meant not, to be. Is it's it? not meant well, but England, but Wales and Scotland yeah. do all the time, ever. And Heineken Cup has to take fewer weekends than nine, and I know it's on eight this year, and that's a step in the right direction. Um, and the Premiership has to get away from this idea that just because you've got 12 teams in the league, you have to play 22 games. And if you have 14, you have to play 26. It's nonsense. It's not the number of teams in the league. It's how many games you ask them to play. Again, I I don't know. Horrible. I'll use the example again, though. Melbourne. Um, No, I'll use NRL. Mm. There are 16 teams. You play 24 games. Yeah. You don't play thirty. Th- you don't play thirty because they recognise it's too many. Of course. So, so, so the, doing the only way we'll get a structured season with a better narrative, which has got the whole point of doing it, player welfare, commercial opportunity, and 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 you were at the moment we're all fighting each other for a bigger slice of a pie that isn't big enough, and we need we each of those levels, Europe, domestic and international, need to give up a weekend or two and restructure their competition and we'd have a much, much, much better product. But then you wouldn't have a playoff either, would you? So if, if we do all the things that no, you I said, I, yeah, I, I, no, agree. No, no, I, I agree the playoff should be there. But yeah. if, if you talk about the structure though that you mentioned around the salary cap. Well, I'll tell you what, after the, after, it's we, a race after, to the we, after we finish this, I'll send you the, I'll send you my structured season when everyone gives up a bit and you never look what it looks like. I'll try and encrypt the Da Vinci code. But, but that's what I mean. But, but with the playoff though, so yeah. if you go on that model that you said, then it's a race to the finish line with the squad that you've got. Therefore, oh, yeah. the winner wins the league. And you win the- I, I like the playoffs. So I think I do, it adds no, a commercial I, I value still, to I the league. I would still have a final series because there's real commercial value in there. There's okay. real commercial value so in there. So more for the commerciality there, of the game. Well, also, yes. Because um, that I've, comes off the back I of the... I have never been a... Sub, I never believed or proposed that the playoffs were there to compensate for the inadequacies of the regular season. I am an unashamed supporter of playoffs or finals football because it creates interests there are bigger events and you grow your sport you know there's a reason why the final four is a really huge thing in college but there's a reason why the super bowl club football rugby in this country needs big big events in big stadia and finals football or playoffs football is the easiest way to get there absolutely agree but summer rugby, no. Why? Too many competing big established sports events. Which ones? Uh, well, if you stay, if let's assume you're talking June, July, August. I don't watch cricket, by the that way. That so. involves Test cricket, the hundred sitting right across, very successful sitting right across August, the start of the Premiership football season, August, the Gopen Golf, Wimbledon. Um, there's a couple of others now. Oh, of course. Global football tournaments every other year, which dot when they're on, did you notice how little coverage the great that great um, Premiership final got this year? Why the Euros were on? Mm. It got nothing. You can't, there are certain sport, there are certain events. The Olympics is one. Oh, and the Olympics every four years. Do you really want to go up against those sports? I don't mean summer in terms of it needs to be in June, July, and August. What do you mean then? I mean. Maybe spring, maybe in better <laughs> in better weather. My point being, did you see what Harlequins when they did a deep dive on their season last year? Yeah. Do you know what they come out with? Go on. They didn't play one game in the rain. Oh, I see. So I did know that. Yes, I did. They didn't play one game yeah. in the rain, and you everyone's see, talking I, about how I'm, they play. I'm less. Uh, this is getting very bad. I, I went to Welford Road last weekend, and it was raining. Okay, well, you're it, a purist it, like me. I enjoyed no, no, it. No, but it was a good game. I enjoyed I know, it. There was a lot of movement. Yeah, I, I thought it's it. a lot of movement. That the pitches are so much better now, Jim. I mean, you, I, I totally accept that. Back in the day, my day, <laughs> even my after, day, you know, there were some shocking pitches around. You used to go to certain ground and think, "This is just going to be a slugfest." You had the algae play on this, and oh, look, some teams did try, but a lot didn't. Um, I don't think. I think uh, uh, it's not like that anymore. Also, I think there are lots of things we could do to improve. I'm going to use the word, although I do cringe a bit. There's a lot we could do to check to improve the product without changing, giving up our 
some of our areas where we have built real value. So the Six Nations is a huge, you can't move the Six Nations much. You move a little bit. I don't think Why anyone not? wants to move that. But there's hardly any, there's hardly any competition. One of the reasons it's so strong, it's like the Cheltenham Festival. Cheltenham Festival, it's the start of spring, you know. Six Nations, it's the light in winter. You know, these things are important. Heritage and tradition and repeatability are important. And I think we could do a pile of stuff to improve how the game looks and how appealing it is without having to resort to uprooting everything and sticking it in a different part of the year. Because my point being around the summer or <clears throat> the better weather one, I'm a dad, so yeah. I take my lad yeah. to rugby. He's had three, four games cancelled. Probably not that interested now. Oh, sorry, I might move the community game to the to, to the summer. Well, when I put it out on social media, that was at raw because they've got cricket as well, well which is arguably yeah, the same demographic. Yeah, yeah. My point is being is around fan experience, both having been a player and I. If if there was summer rugby, I would never have been a professional rugby player because I was shocking on hard ground to the fast game. I made a living <laughs> with the piss wet, the wind and the mud. That is where, that's yeah. why I am where I am now. But my point is, is around the fan experience. Now, I know there's a load of stuff around that. I know that you want to come in on it, but I commentate on the games. I'm standing there, I'm freezing. I'm looking at the fans. I'm looking at, and this is Edinburgh, right? Okay, it's different yeah, yeah, in Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I'm thinking, the game's hard enough to consume anyway. So you need to make it and experience a day out. That's why the Sevens are successful. I went to the Hong Kong Sevens. I didn't watch any of the rugby, but I love the Hong Kong Sevens. Yeah, yeah. I want to go again. That's just a snapshot of it. So I'm thinking, right, during pre-season, at the Edinburgh match, at the damn health stadium, whatever they want to call it now, you go there, you're having a few beers, you can smell the barbecue, there's music on, you want to go. You're happy to pay 20 quid or whatever it is. December, January going into Feb and there is it's, it's blistering wind you, you're lying going it, it, well people still go to watch football in those conditions and uh, taking an even more extreme example doesn't seem to put the fans off in Chicago and Green Bay does it I, I understand what you're saying with them sports but you know like again the experience I don't know about the Chicago I don't know too much about the NFL but the football is so easy to consume it's, <laughs> it's, it's tribal you're going for the tribalism and, and yeah and that's where I, you see that's where I want rugby to get to I, I I want to get rugby closer to French club rugby than anything else, where it genuinely is tribal, or to a degree it's tribal. And I, I think there's a lot we can still do with the with what with how the game is played and officiated and what it looks like before we have to start throwing every rooting up everything and just saying, well, we'll stick it in the summer. That's where everybody it's so crowded for the Broadcast, I mean, at the end of the day, rugby's like any other professional sport. You live and die by your broadcast revenue. You are up against some massive, massive broadcast beasts if you move it into the summer. Last question. Yeah. Who needs to take over from a broadcast perspective? Because my point, again, being I commentate, I've done stuff for ITV, Premier Sports, mm. BT mm. Sport, Prime Video, aka Amazon. So I'm trying to get the kids <laughs> to watch the dad on TV. And this is just one part of it. Yeah. Me. Yeah, yeah. And my family trying to grow the game in my household and be like, your dad's still on TV. <laughs> Look, how do people now consume the game when you've got, you need Sky for the Lions, BT Sport, which I think you need Sky for, Channel 4, it had Channel 5, which is no longer there, which is a shame because I thought Dodos and Flats were class. BT Sport, Premier Sport, Prime Video, I mean, it is a mess, isn't it? Do you it, think anyone's going to come in? Do you think, is there conversations ongoing? Do I do I think that we're going to get a vertical, you mean, like uh, Sky Cricket or Sky Golf? Of course. Or, um, one place to watch rugby. One place to watch rugby. In the UK. Uh, in the UK. In the UK. Okay. Well, or in, 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 let's even whittle it in down. England. In the pre <laughs> Premiership rugby. Um, I know uh, that it's on BT Sport. But... What, I, what I would say about that is that this, in this stage of, the sports development, I think it's really important, and, and I'm, I, I fully accept this is not a, a, a position that everybody agrees with, even in in the broadcasting world. And people who know a lot more about it than me, um, I still feel that it's really important that the Premiership, in particular, which is my particular love, um, has a regular free to air presence. 
Um, and it has to be on that show, on that channel for quite a long period of time, not just for the odd year and then switch to somewhere else and then switch to somewhere else. We've got to get a platform that people can access uh, without subscription. Now, you can't just have that because otherwise the finances of the games completely fall apart. But I think that if we are serious about... Um, if we're serious about growing the game, we need to find a partner, and I do mean that genuinely, not just a broadcaster, a partner who has got um, some kind of subscription model who is prepared to also allow a reasonable number of the other games to be shown on a free-to-air platform. So I think it's quite interesting that during the pandemic, when we had all six games on, people got used to it and liked it. And now there's only three. There is a little bit of a backlash about that. And I understand, you know, production costs are not insignificant. And um, at the moment, we've got three on three on um, subscription and we've got nothing on free to air. I don't think a deal has been done, has it, to replace Channel 5. So we're coming from a long way back um, before you even look at an, an interesting a, a sort of rugby vertical. I I mean, Sky looked at it, obviously, uh, back in the day when they went on that vertical change and rugby didn't make the cut. Golf did, F1 did, cricket did, and obviously football. So that tells you something about where we are. So I come back, and I'm not trying to avoid the question here. I'm not sure I've got a glib, straightforward, simple answer. I'm not sure there is one. What I do know is to get in a position where that might be a possibility 5, 10, 15 years down the line, and you've got to have that sort of, sort of time period time frame we need to grow the audience and it's still no doubt if you have a regular free-to-air presence you will grow your audience that has been shown time and time and time again look at women's football this year whose attendances in grounds are little short of woeful and i don't apologize for saying that it's a, it's a fact average attendance at women's premier league is 2200 people right they are not jamming the turnstiles but on BBC, they're getting over a million, you know, when they show. Look at the women's internationals on BBC, right? Uh, in, not in a great time slot. You know, that was a very, those were very respectable numbers. The, I know it's terribly old school, but the power of linear television has not been completely eroded in this rush to direct to consumer, pay so much and watch as much rugby as you like. We need more casual viewers. You, we need to get people who do watch the Six Nations because historically it's been on free to air and there's not much else on at that time of year to broaden out their rugby watching. And I think it's really difficult to see how you do that purely through digital or subscription. Class. Before we go, mm. I've got to ask this question. Mm. Let me ask around CVC. Yes. Because you're going to be well placed to talk about this, but anyone casually, even in the teams, think they are the saviours of this game. The money that they've put into the game and the equity that they've acquired, Yeah. a snapshot, yes or no, is it a game changer for rugby? Because... What I'm hearing and what I'm seeing is they would not have invested the amount of money that they have if they didn't feel there was a viable commercial opportunity. And you've sold me the dream today to show me that there is a way that this game of rugby that has given us so much can be commercially viable and grow. I certainly think, I do think it can, yes. And I'm, whether the CBC investment in this part of the world is a is a game changer. I, I think probably. Um, and actually, I think from CBC's point of view, it's probably a pretty decent move. Um, my, my, not reluctance, but my the, the point I tend to make when when asked about this, and I have been a number of times, is that I'm not. It. I'm sure it was a pretty decent move by CBC. I wasn't. I'm still not convinced it was a great move or deal for the clubs. I felt they were in a position where it was very, very hard for them to um, turn down an offer of cash on the table, which effectively was simply pulling forward the revenues they were going to earn, you know, 
in in that would of the value that are already being created because let's not forget now that their central distribution what we called earlier the grant if you like from the middle has dropped by 27 percent, and it's dropped by 27 percent in perpetuity but some of the clubs were so strapped for cash it was it was almost impossible for them to say no 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 that's not a very good long-term deal because they needed to keep the lights on so we come back to the we won't reiterate them the points i was making earlier about having to restructure that whole club thing but what i do think cbc's role makes more likely is another point you've already raised i do think they will bring significant pressure to bear an influence to bear and will try to persuade um a re a, a restructuring of the of the schedules i, I do think it's much more likely now with somebody a, 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 a um, an organization that has a as a, an influence across a number of competitions, that it, it improves the likelihood of better coordination. I also think they will probably act as um, a force for change in terms of how the pro- how the product is delivered and the types of experiences that are offered and the and the way in which it's it's put in front of the customer. I think I think that will all be. I think that will all improve. Is it a savior? I, I, I try not to think in quite simplistic terms. I, I think they they could make a really, and they will hope to because they want to make a return. I think they could be a a, a, a very helpful um, factor in growing the sport. And 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 we keep whichever way we look at this, isn't it? Whatever issue we come we look at, we tend to come round to. How do we grow the audience, be, be it on broadcast, be it through digital, or be it actually live in stadia? Because without that, any sport is stuck. If you can't grow your audience, you're not going to prosper. And, and that, I suppose, is my – it comes down to my background. You know, I'm from an area where everybody – you know, rugby was not a class game where I – from in South Wales, everybody played it, everybody followed it, and and I I I've all I suppose that's a big influence on me. I've always felt very passionate about trying to replicate that over a much much bigger area. And I suppose it's why I love going to watch games in the south of France. It's why you know it's my favourite place to go and watch rugby is is to go and watch a big for a game club game in France. Um, not so much in Paris with the internationals, although I, I got the feeling it was much, much better uh, when they played the All Blacks this autumn. But to go and what, to go to Claremont, go to La Rochelle, go to Toulouse, and even further down the bus, Abash Derby, mm. and in Pepinyan when they're when they're strong, which they haven't been for a while. But even the the Pepinyan Rugby League, you know, the Dragons, of you know, course. I just I just think, God, oh, why can't we be more like that in more countries? I suppose I still I'm still very hopeful that we can. Yeah, absolutely. Mark, thank you very much. And we need to do a part two. Of course, there's so much more that we didn't get through. <laughs> Mate, if people are not too terribly bored by this one, they'll be happy to. Well, if they aren't bored of this and they want to hear your voice, I don't think you've done it in an audio book, but I'm going to force you to do it. But you have got a book out, haven't you? So- <laughs> oh, it's, been, it's been going on. It's been out for about two or three years now. Yeah, called um, Unholy Union, When Rugby Collided with the Modern World. And it's beautifully written because it's not written by me. I collaborated with a guy called Mike Aylwin from The Guardian, who's a wonderful, wonderful writer. And, uh, yeah, it was great fun. It's pretty wide-ranging. You know, it's got concussion and drugs and all. It tries to look at things globally. It's got, yeah, well, I think it's a bit... Edgy. No, it's not edgy. I, I think it's a bit... Some some people have read it and said, geez, it's a bit, it's, it's a bit nerdy. And I think it probably is. It was written for a rugby... It wasn't written, I suppose, for a casual fan. It was written to try and at least get some ideas out and some suggestions into the sort of rugby business. Uh, and even at the end, we didn't want to have it sort of, you know, I hate these books that say, well, this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong and never actually say, well, what would you do then? You know, I, I don't, you know. So we did we had a little go at the towards the end. Other than the things, some of the other things that, We've talked about like the CBAs and the salary caps and that. Yeah, they're all in the book, but they're not. The five at the end was something like, and I, I can't remember them all. One of them we've already got. One of them was to change the um, nationality regulations. That, that was one of the five recommendations at the end that stopped player capture and allowed players to play for 
people they're qualified for by birth or grandparents or whatever. It's kind of done. And that. that's that's done. So they've got four left. I say kind of. You see what I've done there? Because <laughs> yeah. there's more that can be done. But that story there is, of there is more that can be done. But it's it's a it's a big shift. And mm. I'm I'm a realist. I, I I'm I, no one's going to magic wand. It's not going to happen. Everything you want is going to happen. And you know we're all never going to agree on everything that we want. But no, I think there's. I still think there's. Um, there's a there's a there's a lot more there's a lot more that can be done because and I I suppose my next one would be uh, if I wrote it again now three years time I'd probably push harder on the way the the things in the way the game looks to the to the customer I I, I think some of the stuff the game is too there are too many stoppages um, I get rid of the water boys I get rid of uh, I treat injuries off the pitch I'd I, I just make the whole game. I, 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 people go on about ball in play. I'm not so worried about ball in play. I'm, 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 I'm much more interested in what I call flow. How, how, how often does the game get stopped, and for how long? You know, if if people make a, um, uh, I, I'm even, I'm even tempted to abolish the knock on. The what? I'm almost, almost, I'm almost tempted. I'm not quite sure yet how, how I really think about it, but I'm. I'm I'm tempted to get rid of the knock on as an offence. If you knock on, just play on. If you drop the ball, just play that on. Pick, is the, that, pick is it the, up. that is the French rugby fan in you, isn't it? Possibly. It could be. As you a part two, just, though. Just play on. Part two. Uh, Mark, thank you very much. Pleasure. And someone Thanks did say pioneer to me when I spoke to them on the phone. And I think our listeners would probably agree that you're not shooting from the hip. These are proven things that you've been involved in uh, across the world. So it's an absolute pleasure. I could have spoke to you all day, but I'm going to have to read your book. Now, I couldn't get it on Amazon, though. Uh, sorry, I'll send you a copy. Yes, please do. Signed copy. <laughs> They're Thanks gathering dust in a warehouse somewhere. <laughs>